My friend Terry keeps a gratitude journal. A gratitude journal. It's an idea she got from Matthew Kelly, a Catholic writer you've heard me mention before. And the idea is as simple as it sounds. She takes time every day to write down what she's thankful for. And it can be anything that comes to mind. Her family and friends, her job, her material blessings, or her faith. And even little things that can be easy to miss, like a a beautiful sunny day, or the kindness of a stranger. My friend said that most days she has no trouble filling a page with all that she's thankful for. But on days when she's struggling with some setback or a challenge in life, being grateful takes more effort. Well, we've come to the final week of our message series titled Lost and Found. The gospel readings throughout this series have given us stories about people and things getting lost and then found again. And we end today with one final story and an important message about one essential way to keep from ending up lost in life. Let's turn to the gospel now. So we heard that Jesus healed a group of 10 people with leprosy. What is leprosy? Well, until very recently, leprosy was a deadly disease that ended in a slow, agonizing, horrible death. So if you got leprosy, it was a death sentence. In Jesus' day, they didn't know what caused it. There was no cure, and it was highly contagious. So people with leprosy were shunned. They were disowned by family, ejected from their towns, and forced to beg until they died. On top of that, the Jewish people believed that leprosy was a curse from God, a punishment for sin. So Jewish law demanded that those with leprosy had to live apart from everyone else. They felt hatred from others. It's no exaggeration to say that 2,000 years ago, the life of a person with leprosy was a living hell. You need all this background to understand just how powerful Jesus' healing was for those 10 people. It also makes what happened after their healing really hard to understand. We were told that only one of them expressed gratitude. One of them, realizing he had been healed, returned glorifying God in a loud voice, and he fell at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. This man was a Samaritan, a foreigner. The others were Jewish. I've always wondered, where did the other nine go? What was more important than saying thanks to the person who healed you from a terminal disease, who literally commuted your death sentence? Did they need to rush to get their old job back? Race to reunite with the family who rejected them? Reconnect with the friends who abandoned them? We don't know where they went. What we do know is they never returned to give thanks to God for the priceless gift they received. This may be the greatest story of ingratitude we find in the entire Bible. And this gospel reading is the one that we proclaim every year at our Thanksgiving Day Mass. And that's because thankfulness, or the lack thereof, is Jesus' point with this story. And beyond saying thanks for material blessings, like a physical healing, Jesus is teaching his followers that their faith is a gift that must be shared. Keeping it to oneself is the surest way to lose faith. As I said, it's how we keep from ending up lost 
like all those individuals we've encountered in the Gospels throughout this series. The older brother in the parable of the prodigal son, the rich man who ignored Lazarus, and the nine lepers in today's parable. Without a truly thankful, generous heart, you and I can end up lost in life, unsure of who we are, what our lives are about, or where we are headed. So how can you and I share the precious gift of faith that we have received? Earlier this fall at Mass, I invited you to write down the name of someone you want to know God's love more deeply. And all the names were posted in the entranceway on a prayer wall. Well, in front of the altar today are all those slips of paper, the names of our loved ones. We should continue to pray for them daily, asking God to lead them as he also leads us. To lead them and to lead us. Have you ever wondered about this huge white structure over top of the altar? It was installed in 1979 when the parish hall was built, and this space was converted from a multi-purpose room to the sanctuary that you see today. At the time this structure was first installed, school children said it reminded them of a Pringle potato chip. It actually symbolizes the cloud that led the Israelites through the desert after escaping Egypt. The cloud was the presence of God, accompanying them and leading them to the promised land. Its presence over our sanctuary reminds us that Christ is present here in his word, in the Eucharist, and present in each other. It's also a reminder that each of us, as members of Christ's church, are being led by God as we journey through life. And I would add that it reminds us that we have an obligation to lead others to Christ and his church. And doing so is one powerful way to express our gratitude to God. Last week at Mass, I shared that I believe God is leading our parish forward through all of the renewal efforts of recent years. God is leading our church forward in love, calling us to be more welcoming to those who are wandering through life, searching and seeking. And I want to remind you of the quote I shared last week from Pope Francis. Love not only means that we wish others well or that we are good to others, but first and foremost, at the root, that we welcome others, make room for others, make space for others. This is Pledge Weekend for Led by Love, Phase 2. I want you to see how God can use you to support our parish's future. Last week, I shared with you images from the architect of the new gathering space, which will be to the right of the church, that we are breaking ground for next summer. Today, I will just share two of the images. The first image shows the exterior of the new space. As I said, this will be to the right of the church as you approach the front doors. The building in red brick is phase two. Currently, this area is green space with our Mary statue. And we will be shifting the Mary statue down a bit to a new prayer garden area beside this building. And as a reminder, this, these and other images are posted in the entranceway where the doorway into phase two will be. You can also view them on our website. And here's an image of the inside of the new space. This angle is if you came in from the church entranceway. As you can see, the design will give flexibility for a gathering of 50 or so in one area for a talk or presentation, or round tables and chairs that can accommodate 150. This will be a space for us, for us to gather with each other, learn from each other, and to be trained for ministry and service. It will also be an inviting and welcoming space that we can bring others into 
including all the buoy bobs and buoy barbs in our lives. And we all have them. I do, and so do you. The estimated cost for phase two is 1.8 million. And thanks to all of our original Led by Love donors, and in partnership with our school, we have most of what we need. The goal for Led by Love phase two is to gather pledges of at least $400,000. And the reason I say at least 400,000 is because there are some elements in the design that we definitely want to include, but may depend upon contributions. For example, an outdoor patio at the entrance to phase two and additional restrooms. Last week as you left mass, you received a brochure and pledge form for Led by Love Phase 2. They were also included in our e-bulletin and are on our website. I ask you to read them over and pray about your commitment. And for those of you who fulfilled your pledge to Led by Love, that initial pledge from five years ago, or are about to fulfill it at the end of this year, I'm not asking you to give again. Though if you feel that you're in a position to do so, your support is most welcome. I made a pledge to Led by Love five years ago, and I'm pledging again today. At the end of your pews are Led by Love envelopes containing pledge forms and pencils. If those on the ends of the pews would pass them down to anyone who needs one, I'd appreciate it. You can do that now. So for those of you who've decided to make a pledge today, please remove the pledge form and the pencil. On the front of the pledge form, with the images of phase two, I'd ask you to fill in your contact information. Then just turn the form over and fill in your pledge information. For phase two, you can extend your pledge over two years with monthly or annual payments of any size you choose. You can use Faith Direct or credit card or check. Payments will begin next month. Be sure to sign and date the pledge form. And when you've done that, then Seal it in the envelope along with your pencil. If you need more time to fill out your pledge, consider it, don't feel rushed. You can bring it to church or mail it in whenever you're ready. At this time, I'm going to ask our host team members to come forward with baskets to receive our pledges.
I want to express my gratitude to you. Thank you for taking this step in faith. We are building our parish's future together.